in our studies in the biblical teaching on sanctification, we have had reason to notice again and again, and doubtless will continue to notice again and again, that one of the most interesting things about the New Testament's teaching on sanctification is the form or structure in which it constantly appears. And no matter what aspect of the New Testament's teaching we examine, we will always find that this particular structure is a characteristic of every aspect of the teaching. And as we've noticed, that structure is this. The exhortations to us to be holy are always rooted and grounded in teaching that encourages us to see what God has provided in order to make us holy. In terms of the grammatical structure of the New Testament's teaching, as we've seen in the New Testament's gospel, the indicatives of God's grace, that is, the revelation of what he has done for us, always precedes in order the imperatives directing us to Christian holiness. God never thrusts us back upon ourselves. He never urges us to improve our Christian lives by pulling ourselves up by our own shoelaces. He encourages us rather to grow up as Christians by sinking ourselves down and down ever more profoundly into the riches of God's grace. God's grace is the soil in which Christian holiness grows tall. And so we notice in the New Testament that the New Testament teaching on sanctification always links two things together. God has done this, therefore you should be this. Or you should be this because or for this is the situation into which God in his grace has introduced you. And we notice that again here in these very important verses in the New Testament in Galatians 5, 16 and 17. There is an exhortation in verse 16. We are exhorted by Paul to live by the Spirit. And he explains to us that only as we live by the Spirit, notice this, will we be able not to gratify the desires of the flesh. Now that's a very important principle for us to observe we are able to refrain from gratifying the desires of the flesh, not simply by focusing our attention on how we can avoid the desires of the flesh. We're able to overcome the desires of the flesh by walking or living in the power of the Spirit. We often say that if you're going to be positive in the Christian life, you need to be negative. And that's true. But here Paul puts it the other way around. He says, if you're going to be negative in the Christian life and overcome the desires of the flesh, you'll only be able to do that successfully if you're also positive in the Christian life. That is, living in the power of the Holy Spirit and walking according to the Spirit. But here is the exhortation. Walk, Christian believers, walk, live your Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit. But then you notice Paul adds in verse 17, do this for. So here he gives us the exhortation in verse 17, in verse 16, we are to walk in the power of the Spirit. Now in verse 17, he gives us the reason why this is so necessary the thing that makes this exhortation so urgent and insistent in the Christian life. And the reason is this. For, he says, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. 
So you follow Paul's reasoning, I hope. Christian, walk, live in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because this is the situation in which you find yourself by God's grace in the Christian life. The Spirit wars against the flesh. The flesh wars against the Spirit. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you will. Now, this is obviously, I think, one of the great key statements which the Apostle Paul makes to us about the nature of the Christian life and the nature of Christian sanctification. And I want us to unpack it briefly this evening by focusing attention on three simple propositions which help us to understand what Paul is saying. The first of them is this, because clearly Paul is speaking to us here about the Christian life as a life lived in a conflict between flesh on the one hand and spirit on the other. This is where you are if you're a Christian. You're on a battlefield. And the forces which are operative in this battlefield, the two armies which face one another in this battlefield, Paul describes as the flesh on the one hand and the spirit on the other. And I have three statements or propositions which will help us, I think, to understand what the apostle is saying. The first one is this. Flesh and spirit are not here two aspects of a human individual, but two characteristics of two ages or epochs in which the Christian lives. Now, it's true, rather obviously, that the Bible speaks about men and women as being both flesh and spirit. We are body and soul, flesh and spirit, the New Testament says. And we, therefore, naturally, when we come to these terms, flesh and spirit, tend to think about these terms in terms of the way we view ourselves subjectively. This is what we are made up of, we might say. Flesh on the one hand, spirit on the other. But Paul is not speaking here about flesh and spirit as two constituent elements in the being of men and women so much as two characteristics of two ages in which and through which the Christian believer is called to live. Let me explain that for a moment. When the New Testament uses the word that's here in the NIV translated sinful nature, the word sarx, which in the older versions was ordinarily translated flesh, it can mean one of four different things. On very rare occasions, the word flesh in the New Testament means this, the outside covering of your body, your skin. On a number of other occasions, flesh can mean, basically, your physical being. We are flesh and blood. And occasionally the New Testament also uses the term flesh in that way. More frequently, however, the New Testament uses the term flesh to denote not skin nor the body in a more general sense. It uses it to denote man or men and women as we view men and women isolated, not separated, but simply isolated from the power and majesty of God. Flesh is an expression that's used in the New Testament to denote human frailty and weakness by comparison with divine power and majesty. But then there is a fourth way in which the New Testament uses the term flesh, and it is the one that is most characteristic of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul. 
in which he uses the term flesh, not simply to to denote human frailty and weakness, but to denote almost, as it were, a dimension of influence and power under which our lives have fallen. The way Paul characteristically does this is to see men and women not simply as isolated individuals, but to see men and women rooted in the fall of Adam and the alienation from God which Adam brought into the world, the kind of thing Paul speaks about in Romans 5, 12 to 21, where he speaks about Adam disobeying God and bringing sin into the world and sin bringing death into the world. And part of what Paul means when he says that we are by nature in our fallen condition flesh, part of what he means is that we belong to and we live in that Adamic world order that is not simply weak because it's human rather than divine but is twisted and distorted and fallen and in rebellion against God, alienated from him, hating him, and under the bondage, as both Paul and the Apostle John emphasize, under the bondage of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Paul puts it rather powerfully, you'll remember, in Ephesians chapter 2, when he says, Before the Spirit brought you into the kingdom of God, Ephesians 2 verse 3, we lived among people, gratifying the cravings of the flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. And the picture he portrays, is a picture of an individual who is enslaved under the authority and power of the flesh. So that for the Apostle Paul, to be in the flesh, you remember how he uses that expression? And it's a different expression from saying that the flesh is in you. Paul doesn't only say the flesh is in you. He says, you are in the flesh. And what he's conveying to us is a sense that we belong to a world order that is doomed in sin and rebellion and distortion and is impotent to transform the situation. And correspondingly, the apostle says that this flesh wars against the spirit. And when he says the flesh wars against the spirit, he is not simply thinking of the spirit's individual working in the life of the believer, but he is thinking, as he's already explained to the Galatians, he is thinking that what this means is the very fact that the spirit is influencing our lives brings with it the notion that Christ has come as the second Adam who has reversed the sinful disobedience of the first Adam, who instead of disobeying, obeyed, who instead of bringing in sin, brought in righteousness, who instead of bringing us into death, has brought us into resurrection life. And it is out of all that Christ has done, Paul teaches both in Galatians and elsewhere, it's out of all that Christ has done, that now from heaven Jesus Christ has poured out his Holy Spirit upon men and women and brought them not simply to rebirth or renewal, but has brought them into a different age or epoch or kingdom altogether. The way Paul puts this at the very beginning of this epistle to the Galatians is that because of what Christ has done for us, because of the gift of the Spirit he has given to us at the beginning of our Christian lives, he says in Galatians 1, 4, he gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. And the evil age which he speaks of here is an age, a dominion, an epoch, 
in which we are under the power of sin and death and in bondage to the flesh. So that when Paul speaks about flesh and spirit, he is not thinking about two aspects of my personal individual life. I'm made of flesh, but I'm also spirit. He is thinking more about two powers that come to bear upon my life. The power of the flesh that drags me down into sin and death from Adam. And the power of the Spirit that lifts me up into righteousness and life. Because he is given to me by my Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, he summarizes this later on in his life in the letter to the Romans when he says to the Roman Christians in Romans 8 9, the glorious truth about you is this. You are no longer in the flesh. You are now in the spirit. Now, you notice he's not simply saying the flesh is no longer in you because the spirit is in you. What he's saying is that by the power of the Spirit, it's as though you have been translated out of one realm, one age, one kingdom, and removed into an entirely different kingdom. You've been taken from the evil age of the flesh and translated into the kingdom of the Spirit. And interestingly, in several of Paul's letters, he describes what it means to become a Christian in exactly that way. Brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Delivered from the evil age into the age of grace. No longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. And it is, of course, Paul is saying to us very obviously, because you have been brought out of the dominion of the flesh into the dominion of the spirit... It is your responsibility to live according to the principles of this new kingdom. And so to walk by the Spirit that you will not yield or give way to the influences of the flesh. But there is a second principle here because that first principle on its own by no means fully explains what Paul is saying. And the second principle is this, that being in the flesh or being in the spirit denotes two different periods of the life of the individual who has become a believer. So, first of all, we have to understand that Paul is not speaking here about two parts of my being. He is speaking about two dominions under the one or the other of which I live. But now we may take that a stage further and recognize that when Paul speaks about being in the flesh or being in the spirit, he is speaking about two different periods in the life of the individual. And he gives us evidence of this throughout this passage. What does it mean to be in the flesh? That is, to be under the dominion of the flesh. Well, it is, according to what he says here in Galatians chapter 5, it is to be absorbed with myself and to be devoted to the satisfaction of my own indulgence. That's why when you read through Galatians chapter 5, one of the things you notice is characteristic of the flesh is the flesh's burning desire, however subtly disguised, to indulge its own ambitions. The self sees itself rather than God as the center of the universe. And everything about the life of the flesh revolves around myself. Another characteristic of the flesh that Paul points out is the way in which in a hundred thousand subtle ways the self hides itself and defends itself from God. 
Paul says this is characteristic of the flesh. The thing that the flesh wants to do is to glory in self. The one thing that God will never permit, as you remember, Scripture says, is that any flesh will glory in his presence. And so what does the flesh do? The flesh protects itself from the destructive glory of God. It protects itself, and this is one of the things that the letter to the Galatians is all about. It protects itself by appealing to special religious privileges. In Galatians, it is the religious privilege of circumcision. And by hiding from the way in which the gospel of Jesus Christ destroys the flesh, hiding from the destructive power of the gospel to destroy the flesh by appealing to religious tradition or religious privilege, or for that matter, to religious action. And in a thousand ways, as I say, the flesh does this. The flesh spends its life constantly doing this, constantly trying to weigh in the balances the good things it's done to balance the bad things it's done. That would be characteristic of men and women who are under the dominion of the flesh. I am acceptable to God as I am because more or less the good things I've contributed balance the bad things I've done. But Paul recognizes that that same subtle thinking can take hold of the Christian believer as well. I am acceptable to God. I'm growing in grace because the good things I've done outweigh the bad things I've done. And in a thousand ways, I seek by the flesh to defend myself from the destructive power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which teaches me that God is utterly intolerant of my flesh glorying in his presence. And this is what Paul is concerned about here, that being in the flesh is a description of life before my self-exalting flesh was brought to nothing at the feet of my Lord Jesus Christ. The death of the flesh and its dominion begins to take place when I am brought to say, nothing in my hand I bring. I don't bring my Jewish roots. I don't bring my circumcision. I don't bring my Passover. I don't bring my baptism. I don't bring my church membership. I don't bring the fact that I come to the Lord's table or the prayer meeting or the Bible study. I don't bring anything that belongs to anything that I could ever achieve. Nothing in my hand I bring. I cling like a desperate man in danger of destruction to the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how he puts it at the end of the Galatian epistle. He says, I will boast in nothing except in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ by which I have been crucified to the world. The world has been crucified to me. And when he goes on in this passage to speak about the works of the flesh, you'll notice the acts of the flesh, verse 19, are obvious. And he indicates to us how the flesh manifests itself and the dominion of the flesh manifests itself in the lives of those who are not yet believers. But what has happened well, this is important for us to understand, and Paul is at great pains in this letter to explain it. What has happened is this. He has told us in Galatians 2, verse 20, which we looked at earlier on, that by coming to faith in Jesus Christ, I was crucified with Christ. And I died to that old world order under the dominion of the flesh. But then you'll notice here in chapter 5, he gives us the other side of that, particularly in verse 24. 
those who belong to Jesus Christ and have therefore been crucified with Christ according to Galatians 2.20. Notice the difference in the wording here. Those who belong to Jesus Christ, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now here are two sides of what is involved when any person becomes a Christian. Now notice Paul is not saying to us, you must crucify the flesh. He is saying, if you are a Christian, you have crucified the flesh. Just as in Galatians 2, when he says, I'm crucified with Christ, he doesn't say, you must become crucified with Christ. He says, if you're a Christian, you have been crucified with Christ. Now he gives us the other side of that. He says, in coming to faith in Jesus Christ, it's not only true that I have been crucified with Christ, but in taking hold of Jesus Christ, I have in that action of taking hold of Jesus Christ crucified the flesh. I have, as it were, radically nailed that old order under which I formerly lived. I have nailed it to the cross of Jesus Christ to die. And I no longer live under its dominion, even if it is true that I am not yet fully released from its influence. And that is the third thing that we must see. On the one hand, flesh and spirit are epochs, worlds, kingdoms, dimensions, not simply aspects of my individual life. On the other hand, being in the flesh and being in the spirit denote two identifiable periods of the experience of the individual. Before I came to faith in Jesus Christ, I was in the flesh and under the dominion of the flesh. Now that I have come to faith in Jesus Christ, I am no longer under the dominion of the flesh because I have nailed the dominion of the flesh to the cross. I have torn up my citizenship in the kingdom of the flesh. And I have now, by the grace of God, been brought into the kingdom and the life and the dominion of the Spirit. But the third principle that's important for us to grasp is this, that walking according to the flesh or according to the Spirit underlines that there are still two different competitors for our lifestyle as Christians. So you see how, in a sense, this New Testament teaching brings us, as it were, from the large-scale picture to the personal picture and now to the immediate picture. Flesh and spirit are, as it were, two different world orders. But I have lived, if I am now a Christian, I've lived, as it were, through these two world orders. I was once in the flesh, I'm now in the spirit. But now Paul brings us, as it were, right up to date and underlines for us, as he does here in verses 16 and 17, that walking according to the flesh or walking according to the Spirit underlines that there are constantly two different competitors for the lifestyle of the Christian believer. He or she has been delivered from the age or dominion of the flesh and brought into the age or dominion or life of the Spirit. But in the life of the Spirit, we live that life of the Spirit in a world and even in a body that has been and to the visible eye remains under the dominion of the flesh. And the task the Christian believer is given is to live out 
the reign of the Spirit in his or her life in a world and world order dominated by the flesh and even in a bodily existence that has been addicted to the flesh in some cases for many years. And because that is so, Paul is urgent in his exhortation to us that because we are no longer in the flesh but in the Spirit, it is incumbent upon us day by day, hour by hour, to make sure by God's grace that we are walking in the realm, in the power, in sensitivity to the Spirit, and not walking in the realm or the power or with sensitivity to the flesh. That's why Paul says the flesh lusts or wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that, and I think probably the best translation of what he says at the end of verse 17 is this, so that you cannot live any way you please. That would be the way of the flesh. The way of the flesh is to live any way that I please. But because we are no longer in the flesh, we are in the Spirit. And yet we are living in the Spirit in a world that is so manifestly still under the dominion of the flesh. And we are living out the Christian life even in our own bodies that have been under the dominion of the flesh. The apostle exhorts us, keep on walking in the Spirit, because that is the only way in which you'll be able to live a Christian life that is no longer dominated by the principle, I will do whatever pleases me. I suppose there is at least an element or an echo of what Paul is saying here in the kinds of things that we see in every strata of experience when people are wonderfully and in a very decisive way delivered from addiction. It may be any kind of addiction. It could be addiction to drugs of some kind, but it could be any kind of addiction. It could be addiction to sport. And they are brought to a place where the grand resolution is made, where the addiction, is, as it were, is nailed down and left. But you see, they have to live the new life in a mind, in a body that has been devoted to and addicted to this or that that has dominated their lives and held them long in bondage. And so the whole future, the whole future is a constant series of important decisions to live the new life and not to fall back into the old life. And Paul is really saying to us here that in a massive scale, that is true of the Christian believer not just of one addiction, but of a life that has been addicted to self and now has had to learn in the presence of Jesus Christ that in his presence no self can glory. And so we are challenged constantly by the apostle that if we are going to live by the Spirit, then that means the daily decision to please Christ and not to please self, to walk in the power of the Spirit and not to walk in the power of the flesh. Now you might think for a moment that the Apostle Paul gives us very little practical counsel here, but as a matter of fact in these verses, it seems to me he gives us five principles which if we grasp will enable us to walk in the Spirit and to refrain from falling into the influence of the flesh. And if I may call 
my friend, apt alliterations, artful aid to serve us again. Let me give you to them, give them to you as well. They are five R's. The first is this. Vital for you and me as Christians to recognize the enmity there is between the flesh and the spirit. The more desensitized we are to the fact that we are living in a warfare context, the less successful we're going to be in living in the spirit. The Christian who succeeds in this business is the Christian who recognizes the urgency of the conflict in which he or she finds himself or herself. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, Christian, recognize that you're in the middle of a battle between the flesh and the spirit, and they are like armies waging war for your life, in your life. The second practical principle is this. Not only recognize the enmity there is in your situation, but remember the status you have been given by God's grace. Yes, there is a war on for your life. Flesh warring against spirit. Spirit warring against flesh. But you are not piggy in the middle in this war. You are in the spirit. You are in the spirit. If the spirit of Christ dwells in you, says Paul in Romans 8, 9. And because that is true, You have all the resources of the Son of God and the gift of His Spirit to enable you to conquer in the battle. The third principle is this. The apostle teaches us to realize in our lives the calling we have been given. And he puts it in a number of ways in this passage, but particularly he stresses, live by the Spirit and you won't gratify the flesh. Later on in his life, he puts it in that marvelous way in Romans 13, 14. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost as though he were saying, put on the fruit of the Spirit that you see in Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Some of you remember that that was the verse that brought the great Augustine into the kingdom of God. When he was out in the garden and he heard the child's voice saying, playing again, pick it up and read it. And he picked up the New Testament that was lying on the table and it opened there at Romans 13, 14. Augustine put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. He had spent most of his life making all the provision for the flesh that any self-indulgent young man could ever have cared for. And he had struggled to be better. But the thing that he had missed out was not struggling against the flesh. The thing he'd missed out was putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are to realize our calling in our lives, then we must learn more and more to do this day by day. You remember the great old hymn, I bind unto myself today, the strong name of the Trinity? You ever done that, put on Christ and Christ's resources consciously in your life? It is the way to live in the Spirit. Recognize the enmity. Remember your status. Realize your calling. Respond or be sensitive to the Spirit. If you are led by the Spirit, says Paul, You're not under the law. That is to say, you're not under the condemnation of the law. Being led by the Spirit will deliver you from a lifestyle in which you will find yourself constantly coming under the condemnation of the law. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? Well, again, we've got to turn to his later writings in Romans chapter 8, where he picks this up. He says, those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. And what's characteristic of the children of God is that they call God Abba, Father. And because they belong to the family of God, 
they, by his grace, put out of their lives everything that isn't in keeping with the family lifestyle. And so here he gives us a great principle. Being led by the Spirit means that I'm led to the Father. And being led to the Father and seeing him in his grace, becoming sensitive to his presence, I don't want to do anything that would bring down the family name And the fifth principle he gives us is that we are to learn that we will reap from what we sow to the Spirit. Do not be deceived. God God cannot be mocked. Chapter 6, verse 7. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the flesh reaps from the flesh destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit reaps from the Spirit eternal life. We sow to the Spirit and we produce the fruit of the Spirit. And the more we produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, the more we are making no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We will doubtless come back to this principle again, but it's such a vital principle for us to learn in the Christian life that when we do battle with the flesh, it's never enough to concentrate our attention on the flesh. We must concentrate most of our attention on the spirit just as a general in an army would never focus all of his attention on the enemy without focusing his attention on his resources and his strategy. And it wouldn't surprise me if there are some of us who have been battling with the flesh in one particular way or another, perhaps for a long time in our Christian lives, and feel we have made very little headway. And the reason is this. In seeking to make no provision for the flesh, we've become so engrossed in the flesh that we've lost sight of the Spirit and lost sight of Christ, in whom alone are found the resources that we need to enable us to overcome the flesh and make no provision for it. May God help us. We are all in a battle. Most of us are wounded soldiers. And we need to get round one another and to encourage one another And to say to one another, let's walk in the Spirit. Let's be a fellowship of people who walk in the Spirit. And a fellowship who don't make provision for the flesh. The Spirit, not the flesh. Let's pray. Our Father, as we read and re-read your word together, we are constantly amazed as we discover what we let ourselves in for when we first came to living faith in Jesus Christ. How we thought that we were coming to him to be our savior because we were conscious of sin in our life. We never dreamt that he would bring us from one order of reality into a new order of reality altogether. We never dreamt that this word that you have given to us would be so limitless in the teaching that it brings to bear on our minds and our wills and our emotions. We marvel that we came like little lambs 
to the edge of a stream and have discovered that we have put our feet into an ocean of your grace and wisdom and glory. But we are conscious also that we've been brought into a battlefield and we often feel it. We feel the struggle. We often fail and are discouraged and depressed. We often find ourselves, our eyes cast inwards and downwards, bemoaning our sin and our failure. Remind us, we pray, that we are no longer in the flesh but in the spirit, no longer in Adam but in Christ, no longer defeated but made in Jesus Christ more than conquerors through him who loved us. And help us to see, we pray, through your word, the sheer grandeur of what Jesus Christ has done for us and the glory of the power of the Spirit that we will walk in the Spirit and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Give us a taste, we pray, even in these coming hours and days of what this means for Jesus' sake.